Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about sheds. We'd like to thank Pam Lane for liking and sharing the podcast. And we had an interview with Joe Truini. He's the author of several books on how to build sheds. Archaeologists say that the early Europeans were building storage sheds out of mammoth bones and the skin from the mammoth. Hmm. And then ancient Romans, they were building elaborate sheds. They would tile the roofs and they would have landscaping around it. <laughs> and then Joe would like this. They, archaeologists say that the first book about building sheds was on bronze tablets dating back to about 300 BC. <laughs> it had detailed instructions how to build a shed to store straw. Wow. <laughs> and then in ancient Egypt, there was a god of danger and deadly animals, and this god's name was Shed. <laughs> if you're doing yard work or if you have a garden, it's really nice to have a shed to free up some of this room in your garage to store your lawnmower. If you have a house, it would be nice to have a shed. If you have a house, you should have a shed <laughs> because you can store your lawnmower, your yard tools, fertilizers, which a lot of these have quite an odor mm-hmm. to them. Your gas cans, especially if you have an attached garage, you should never store your gas can in your garage. Mm-hmm. And if you're storing gas cans in the shed, you should fill them no more than 95% full Hmm. because you need room for expansion if they heat up. Hmm. And then when you're thinking about a shed, you can get kits at the lumber yard or the home centers, or you can build your own with plans from scratch. That's exciting. If you're thinking about buying a kit, you can get metal, plastic, or wood. Metal is usually from galvanized steel or aluminum, and they're very lightweight panels, so they're very easy to assemble. They're insect-proof. You're going to have pre-drilled parts. So even if you have basic tools, it's Mm -hmm. pretty easy to put together. And what you're looking for is something with a baked-on finish to resist corrosion. And then I would always look at the warranty that's going to kind of guide you to the better quality kits. Mm -hmm. With this, if you get a scratch, it's easy to touch it up. You hit it with a little primer and paint. It's going to stand up to a wide range of temperatures. So no, no matter what part of the country you're in, metal does very good. Mm-hmm. But over time, all of these will generally corrode, especially the very light metal. Right. Depending on the part of the country you are, if you get heavy snowfalls, mm-hmm. some of these roofs, some of the ratings I read, some of the roofs collapsed or bent from That's heavy from <laughs> heavy snow. And another complaint I saw a lot was it just wasn't attractive once they, once they built it. The mm-hmm. picture looked good. But once they built it, it wasn't as attractive as they thought it would be? Well, my parents had a metal shed for a long time. Okay. And that was one of our jobs in the summer, was to paint the shed. That was a bummer. (laughs) With plastic sheds, there's a wide variety of materials that they use, so I would look at the warranty as a guide to the quality. Some of the less expensive ones, the color fades over time, or they become brittle from sunlight. Mm -hmm. And then what's nice about plastic is they're very lightweight, very easy to assemble. A lot of them don't need any tools or just a rubber mallet (laughs) to knock together. And some are modular. So if you create this shed, you can then add sections or accessories later on if you want to build a bigger shed. The so lar- now my parents have a plastic shed like this, right? And it's cute because it kind of looks like a house, it looks like uh-huh. a dollhouse, right? Yeah, some are great looking. Um, and it's got like two windows on the side. You could get like <laughs> yeah, cool, uh, uh, planters to put on, you know, on the right. window sills. So, right. yeah, I mean, it's I think it's super cute. Yeah, they're cool, it, but you need to check like the weight limits. If you plan on storing a lot of stuff on the inside walls, mm-hmm. the weight limits vary. So that's one other thing that I would look look at. Because wood and metal are going to be much stronger, mm-hmm. so they'll support a lot more. But it comes in a wide variety of shapes, colors. Well, it, I love this shed because I don't have to paint it. Right, right yeah. <laughs> they, they are pretty much maintenance-free. But the one thing that they don't like is extreme temperature changes. So some can buckle in extreme heat mm. or in extreme cold. They can They can contract and then pop open all the, the gaps where they're locked together. That's a bummer. So... It just like explodes. <laughs> yeah, okay. it implodes. So you gotta you gotta consider that where you're located. With wood, you've got a lot of options for your style, your color, your shape, and the roof itself can either be standard shingles or composite. They're very strong, durable, depending on the type of material. So I would look at the warranty, see what the siding is made of. Mm-hmm. I would look at the snow load rating if you're in an area that snows, the wind load rating. 
What's and that? see so how how strong the wind is before it just lifts the whole thing <laughs> away. And then whether the siding is treated to resist insects and fungus, you can get them pre-primed or natural wood. Mm -hmm. With the wood, you're going to need more tools. It's definitely going to be more work, more assembly time. You're probably going to be building the trusses for the roofing. And then depending on your kit, you may have to buy additional flooring, the material for that, and the shingles. Hmm. But check the description when you're comparing because, you know, different kits at the same lumber yard, you know, right. we have different requirements. And then the downside with wood is it can attract pests. It can rot over time. It has Termites. to be... Right. So it has to be maintained. You've got to keep a paint on it or keep a stain or a clear protectant mm -hmm. on it. With the wood kits, you may see OSB. What does that and, mean? And that's oriented strand board. That still doesn't so, help me. <laughs> so this is glued sheets of wood chips. It's heat cured. They use waterproof adhesives. And builders started using OSB in the 1970s hmm. and because it was less expensive than plywood, and they used it for walls, roof sheathing, floor underlayment. And OSB meets all the national building codes. But the first generation of OSB had problems with moisture absorption, <laughs> so, that, so it was a real drag. And then they, they, they didn't dry very quickly. But now the new resins and waxes they use in OSB, mm -hmm. it makes them more resistant to moisture. Well, that's a good thing. And then the OSB sheets, they're solid throughout, so there's no soft spots like you, you can get in some plywoods. Mm -hmm. They're a couple of pounds heavier per panel or per sheet, hmm. and they're still prone to swelling along the edges when wet, and then, then they just still dry very slow. Whereas plywood is going to resist moisture, it dries faster, mm -hmm. and many of the flooring manufacturers are still recommending plywood rather than OSB if you're putting down, let's say, tile. Mm -hmm. And then with plywood, they're using thin sheets of wood, and then they're glued to each other at alternating 90-degree angles, so they call it cross-lamination. And this is really creating a very strong, stiff sheet, mm -hmm. and then it resists expansion and contraction. That's a good thing. If you see T111 siding... You these, should know what that means. These are the sheets where they have a groove, a vertical groove every 8 inches. So mm -hmm. you see this on homes, on businesses. And apparently on sheds. Absolutely. So it'll, it'll either come OSB or plywood, and the plywood is a five-ply sheet. Mm -hmm. But if you see T111, you know that you're going to have that look of the vertical grooves. Mm. Rough sawn means that there's no smoothing or sanding to them. Sawn? S-A-W-N. Hmm. So it's rough sawn. So it's just unfinished. It's a little less expensive, mm -hmm. and then you're either going to have to stain it or put some type of finish on that. The LP Smart Side, I've seen in a lot of these kits, and this is treated engineered wood. It's zinc coated, and so it protects it against termites and fungus, hmm. and many of these have a 50-year warranty. Nice. If you have one of these kits where you have either OSB or exterior plywood and you need to cut it, you need to be aware that they use boric acid, and some of them, the glues still use formaldehyde. So uh -oh. if you're, if here you're, we go again. <laughs> so like we talked about MDF mm -hmm. in the sanding episode, you want to make sure that you're wearing a dust mask and goggles, and you don't want to be breathing this in. And your dust mask should be a minimum N95. Everybody knows that. Well, all of our listeners know that. <laughs> When you're comparing the kits, I would definitely take a look at the accessories that you can get with it because some have integrated shelving systems. Mm. I would look at the weight limits too on that. You can get integrated baskets, which are convenient to hold small items or balls if you've got a lot of kids' toys and things. You can get hooks that are designed for electrical cords or garden hose, mm -hmm. and then specialized hooks for garden tools if you have edgers and trimmers. So it really makes it convenient and easy to store stuff. Right. And some of these plastic systems are different from the wood or metal, mm -hmm. so it's nice to kind of compare that before you make your final decision. You can also get ramps. No way. So, <laughs> so depending on where your shed is laying, it makes it easier to get you know garden carts or lawnmowers in and out. Anything with wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Once you pick your shed kit, you'd want to call 811 to mark any underground utilities. That usually takes a few days before they come out. Mm -hmm. And then check with the village for any restrictions or permits needed. So after I talked to Joe, I called around a little bit. And some communities, there's no permit required if your shed is less than 200 square feet. Hmm. But a couple of them were less than 100 square feet. That's a big difference. And then if you wanted an on-ground foundation, it has to be smaller than 200 square feet. And then anything larger than that mm -hmm. may require a permanent foundation. Hmm. 
A couple of the other things where it needs to be five or six feet away from the property line, 10 feet from the house, no taller than 10 feet, but it varies <laughs> a lot by community. Mm -hmm. And then make sure that you're keeping it away from the septic system. You want to avoid low-lying areas, especially if you get flooding or standing water mm -hmm. when there's heavy rainfall. So my parents' backyard is a hill. Okay. And so the shed is at the bottom of the hill. Right. <laughs> so I was talking to my dad actually about this last night, and I asked him because it's on a concrete slab. Okay. And he said, I, I'm like, did you have that poured? He said he poured it himself. He's like, it's not level. He's like, I made sure that <laughs> the bottom of the shed was lower. So the slab, he's like, that way all the water would just go in the front door and roll <laughs> out the back. <laughs> he cut a couple holes in the back of the shed. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> there you okay, go. Dad. Great tip. <laughs> he's I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Some of these kits are going to come with a foundation frame to set the whole shed on or four four inch by four inch runners because mm -hmm. you want air circulation under these, especially wood and metal. And with the foundation on an on grade, so this is sometimes called a floating foundation where you're not setting it on top of a concrete slab, you're mm -hmm. generally using solid concrete blocks and pressure treated lumber to keep it up off the ground and you're leveling this. The blocks, you've got to level them, align them, and when you're stacking your blocks, you want to glue these together with construction adhesive. Oh, interesting. And a couple of the top rated for this type of work is Loctite. They're polyurethane, so it's L-O-C-T-I-T-E. Mm -hmm. And Sika Bond, and that's S-I-K-A-B-O-N-D. And they're polyurethane also. At most of the home centers, the concrete blocks are going to be 16 inch by 8 inch, and then it's going to be either 2 inch thick or 4 inch thick. That way you can vary it if you have to level it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to dig down and you're going to create a 3 inch or 4 inch bed of gravel, and you're going to level it. You're going to use a tamper and pack it down. This is going to allow drainage and prevent the blocks from sinking into mm. the soil. And then depending on the shed, if you have four inch by four inch runners under there, you're going to lay this out so it fits exactly under this. And you want to set the blocks about every four feet or less to distribute the weight. And then if you're creating a frame to set your shed on, then you'll lay it out so it, the frame sits exactly on these blocks. Nice. If you have a very small shed or the plastic sheds, you can just create a paver base foundation. So we dig down a couple of inches, lay sand, level that real nice, and then just put... just listen to our podcast on building oh, no. a paver base. Yeah, the, the, and that one's really good. Yeah, dig down six inches, <laughs> two inches of sand. Yeah, that, that's going no place. <laughs> but just paver block does a really nice job for the small sheds. Mm -hmm. Some of the top rated shed kits, and mm -hmm. most of these companies are going to have small, medium, and large kits. Leisure Season, Arrow Shed, Rubbermaid, Suncast... Bosmere, B-O-S-M-E-R-E, mm -hmm. and Lifetime, and Lifetime. Take a look online at this 6446 shed. It is amazing. It's huge. It's 15 by 18 feet. Is this the one you showed me? Yeah, it has 6 foot, it 8 like inch head. House. Yeah, it's amazing. It has uh, break proof windows. It has air mm -hmm. vents in it, double doors. It is really amazing what they do with plastic. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some cool sheds out there. Another interesting thing I saw was 2x4 basics. Mm -hmm. So it's the number 2x, the number 4 basics shed kit. Mm -hmm. And this gives you all the galvanized steel connectors, a material list, a cut list, and the instructions. And then you build it yourself and use these parts to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. So you're picking your roof and your side and your flooring, but right. then you have all the connectors. And then you know what else you can get? No, what? Our fabric sheds. So Shelter Logic has shed in a box, and it's just basically <laughs> kind of like a cool tent nice. to put your stuff in. So it you know it keeps the rain mm -hmm. and sun and you know a light snow, I would say, <laughs> off it. And then Yard Stash, they have storage tents. Hmm. So it, an inexpensive alternative just to kind of shelter things. Nice. I talked to Joe Truini about building sheds, and he had a few tips. Joe, how you doing? I'm well. How are you? Real good, thank you. Hey, Cindy and I were talking about shed kits, but if I were planning on building my first shed, some of the key things I should be thinking about. The first step most people think is the, the building itself and the structure and what it would look like and what they want to store in it. But really, the first step has to be to decide whether the town will even allow you to build a shed in your yard. <laughs> right? Because so many homeowners they're all, get all excited. They get right. their plans. They've even bought lumber. Then they realize they need a building permit. And they go to the town, and the town says, no, something, right. you can't build it at all. 
because if wow, there's a certain community, they might have homeowners association rights, which prevent sheds from being built, or you can't build it where you think you want to build it because of any number of reasons, too close to the septic, too close to the neighbor's line, too close to a water well. You know, I've seen people, they just have three acres of land and the town tells them they can't build the shed anywhere. So, yeah, so very smart. So step one is find out whether you can. <laughs> right. The first step is to go through the town to make sure you can build it. They usually want to see a rough plan of what you're going to build just to make sure it's not too big or too tall or whatever. Okay. And they're going to want to know about the foundation because depending on the size of the, the shed, you know, you might need to have a permanent foundation or an on-grade foundation. So there's a lot. But the first stop, to answer your question in a little roundabout way, the first stop should be at the town hall with the building. Okay. Permit. And what have you found across the country? Is there a size limit or is there kind of a, a, a minimum size that usually a village will allow? In most cases, there's neither. It can be as small okay. as you want or as big as you want. The deciding factor is over how many square feet do you need a permanent foundation, meaning you have to dig down to the frost line. And here, okay. I live in Connecticut, here it's about 200 square feet, typically, although codes change from town to town. It's usually anything over 200 square feet, you have to go down to the frost line. Um, anything under that, you can just set it what's known as an on-grade foundation, which is basically either wood timbers or concrete blocks that sit right on the ground. So there's very little okay. excavation. And if I were building my first shed, is it smart? And, and let's say I don't need a, a, a lot of space to store. And on-ground, probably easy to execute. Oh, yes, the on-grade foundation. Yeah, much easier. Because even if your ground, even if your property is a little out of level, which most properties are, right, sure. you can stack up concrete block on the low end, you know, okay. even it up with the high end of the property. And when we're t when I'm saying concrete block, I'm talking about solid concrete block. You know, they're okay. usually four by eight by 16 inches. You can't use wall block, hollow wall block, because they'll obviously crack and crumble. But with solid concrete block laid flat, and then you can shim it up with pressure treated lumber or composite lumber, you know, to, to adjust the height exactly where you want it. But yes, on grade foundations are much, much easier. And I think this is a great skill if, you know, if we're just starting to learn or just planning on developing some skills, remodeling skills, I think this is a great project because I'm looking, like I was looking at your book, Building Sheds, which is fantastic. Oh, thanks. It's almost like, it's like building a home. Absolutely. The only thing missing is the plumbing and the electricity, <laughs> although you probably wouldn't want to add plumbing. A lot of people do run electricity to sheds, depending on what you're using sure. it for. Um, but you're right. Very much, many of the techniques are exactly the same as house building. And with your sheds, if you're because I noticed uh, a couple of the tips you gave were there's some really nice alternate uses for sheds for a playhouse, a workshop, even a guest cottage. You were suggesting. Are, are you doing any drywall like a green board inside in a shed, or we'd want to totally avoid that? Well, a lot of people like using them as a guest cottage because they seem really simple and quaint and rustic. So often they're, they're obviously they're insulated, but they're then finished often with with like a tongue groove planking, you know, okay. something more rustic looking because usually the there's not a ceiling because they're relatively small. So to get a sense of space, they leave the either exposed joists or they enclose them a little bit. But, you know, you have like a cathedral ceiling feel. So it's often okay. a very rustic feel. So it's usually done in cedar or pine boards, sometimes red ah, boards if you're out west to give it a, sure. a more rustic feel to it. Okay. So when I'm thinking about my shed project, what are a few things that I should be considering? Well, for storage, the first thing you want to do is evaluate your storage needs, right? Because that's really different from household to household. Some people, okay. maybe it's just for the husband who does a lot of woodworking and he's going to be keeping tools and lumber in there. And, or maybe it's a, more of a household, a household with, with kids in it. Maybe they're going to be bicycles and sporting equipment. And sure. so once you evaluate what you're going to be storing in it, if you're going to be putting a ladder in it and it's a 10 foot ladder, obviously you have to make sure you have 10 foot of clearance. Don't build a 10 sure. foot shed because sheds are measured from the outside. So you can't put a 10 foot ladder in a 10 foot shed because uh, obviously it's not 10 foot inside. Uh, yeah, very smart. So, you know, if you need, if you know you're going to be storing something specific, a perfect example is a riding mower. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people build a shed for the riding mower and they can't get it through the door. It's measured the mower, but not the mowing deck. Right. Well, that's great, but now you can't get the darn thing through the door. It All seems right. really obvious, but believe me, I've seen it before. So first, evaluate what you're going to store and build accordingly, whether it's the interior size of the shed or the width of the door. And obviously, that's if you right. need a ramp or something like that, if you're going to be bringing in wheelbarrows and lawnmowers and that kind of thing. Um, and then you have to decide 
where you're going to build it on the property. And again, the town building inspector might have a say in that because you can't build it too close to a property line, too close to a septic system, a, um, a well head for if you, have, if you have well water. So they'll steer you toward the right site. And people often ask me, well, I like build, I like putting it in the back of the property away from the house as far as possible in the corner of the yard we never really use. And that's great. But if you think about it, if you're doing, if you're using this for storing kids' bicycles, what are the chances your kid's going to take his bike across the backyard all the way and put it away? <laughs> It'll never happen. Right. Right. It'll never happen. You know, so in a case like that, that's why evaluating your storage needs up front. We'll say, okay, well, my kids are going to be storing their bicycles and their basketballs in there, so maybe I'll put it closer to the end of the driveway, which makes perfect sense. That's smart. <laughs> right. And, and while I'm thinking about that, I, I wanted to raise another point that I've been asked. Um, this is You mentioned my book. This is the third shed building book I've written, so I, I get lots of questions over the years. And the other sure. one is, should the shed be built to look like my house, or should it look completely different than my house? Ah, that's interesting. It's a really, like, I never thought of that until I started writing yeah. these books and people started writing to me and calling me. And it is really an interesting question and there's no right answer. Me personally, I live in New England and most of the sheds and outbuildings are built to look like barns and state sure. people's and they're beautiful and they don't look anything like the house. Right. But I've also seen them and in fact, in my book, I built one that looks exactly like the house and it doesn't have anything to do with the proximity to the house either. Now, if it's right, right next to the house, it doesn't mean it has to look like the house. And in fact, I prefer when it doesn't. So the general rule is it does not have to look just like the house. Okay. It doesn't mean you can't do that, but it's really better sure. to make it, I think, to stand off to be its own, have its own architectural design. And it actually makes it look a little special instead of it looks like a piece of your house broke off and is like seceding. You know? So <laughs> I, pref I prefer to see it built different, different siding, different roofing material, different color than to look exactly like the house. Um, but that's just a personal preference. Well, it's funny coming from a background where I've only ever built kits and looking at some of the designs in your books, it is amazing how beautiful they are. And then when you add landscaping around it, yep. it, it really makes a statement yep. for your storage. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. In your shed, are there some key storage elements that you would consider? Absolutely. And again, this goes to what you're using the shed for. If you're using it okay. strictly for storage, then adding shelving and pegboard is often not a great idea because you end up piling stuff up in front of it and you can't get to them anyway, right? So, uh, interesting, um, yeah. That, again, is evaluating your storage needs. But if you're going to be using right. it for like a potting shed, right, or a workbench, you know, like a woodworking shop, and, and you want to put a workbench. So a workbench is great because you can store things under it and you can use it as a work surface. A pegboard is great because you can hang tools on it and they're readily accessible instead of being, because they'll get buried, or ordinarily right. get buried in a shed. And that also leads to an, sort of an important design um, aspect of shed is windows. Like everyone loves putting windows in a shed, and I can understand why. If you don't have electricity in there, it's great to have that light come in, and it looks great on the outside and the inside. But every time you put up a window, you lose storage space on that. Yeah, very true. And yeah. you also, you're probably not going to pile stuff up against the window. And if you are, then what's the point of having a window? So <laughs> right. have to sort of take that into consideration as well, which is why often the very back of a shed might not have any windows only because, you know, you don't see it from your house and who cares what the neighbors see. And this way you can pile stuff up on that back wall or put up shelving. To answer your question, I think a workbench is a great idea. Pegboard is great, but only if you can get to it. If it's not going to get buried behind, you know, stacks of luggage and Christmas ornaments and you have to keep moving boxes every time you want to get to your tool, then it doesn't make much sense. So, right. again, evaluating your storage needs and build accordingly. Um, but pegboard and workbenches, that kind of thing are, are great. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as the roofing, I look at the shed and when I was going through your plans, again, I see this as a great place to learn some skills, develop some skills, even like roofing. Yep. You're basically doing exactly what you would do on your home's roof with these sheds. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you, and, it's got the same function, right? You got to keep water out of your house. You want to keep water right? out, of your, out of your shed. And that's actually a really interesting point you make about learning your skills. And a lot of people who are like what we call weekend warriors, right? DIYers, they're not trained carpenters. Right. They like working with their hands. They like doing carpentry. It's a perfect project because it's out back. It's not, it's not like you're deciding to tear out the kitchen and then four months later right. you're still eating off the hot plate, right? If it takes right. uh, two years to build the shed, you know, you're know you not disrupting the family. If you're making a big mess, nobody really cares. And you get to practice this. And if it, and if it doesn't come out absolutely perfect, well, it's a shed, you know, so you know, right. the studs are not perfectly spaced. You know, as long as it meets the building code, that's all you're right. concerned with. And how many people 
get a chance to put on a roof. Nobody does. Or right, uh, exactly. Few. And here, it's great because you get the roof, but you're not up there for a three days roofing. Right? How long is it? Right. <laughs> re-roof right. shed in one day and one afternoon. It goes on pretty quickly. And you get to experiment. In fact, in the book, I try to show different options. You could certainly put three tab asphalt shingles on every single shed. Right. I, I, this is my third shed building book. I don't think I've put three tab shingles on any of them because there's many more <laughs> interesting options, especially these days, right, with the right. plastic composites that look like slate or look like wood and they last forever. Um, yeah, they have great design, yeah. So, yeah, roof, I mean, you have to be careful, of course. You have to be safe and you're, you're still up off the ground 10 or 12 feet. But, yeah, I, I've always enjoyed roofing, especially a small roof. Any other key things? I guess once you, um, you know, you have to make sure you're using the correct materials, you know, like anything okay. close to the ground should be pressure treated. Anything uh, okay. down can be construction grade. And that's really important. And again, that's really a key point of going through the town because they'll ask you those questions. If you're not really sure if you're a first time builder and you don't really know where or what pressure treated it is or where you're supposed to use it. The building inspector should point out when you send in your plans and he reviews them. Okay. okay, make sure for the mud sill and the floor frame you're using pressure treated lumber. It's like, okay, well, this way the guy knows. Otherwise, it'll rot right out from under you. So, you know, make sure you're using the right materials. And when it comes to things like windows and doors, you can build them, you know, but okay. that's the kind of product. Those are the kind of products where you're better off just buying them. Even okay. if doors, wood doors are relatively easy to make and build. And in the book, I think I show three or four different door options. You know, if you want to just go out and buy an exterior door, just like you'd put on a door and a house, that right. you know, there's no shame in that. You know, it'll save you time. It'll be yeah. more secure. Smart. And some of this that I'm talking about will depend on what you're using the shed for. I'm, I'm sure. talking mostly about storage, but of course, if it's a kid's playhouse or a guest house or, you know, work shop, you know, you might, you have other options with all of these shed building aspects. And when you're talking about taking a plan to the village, I guess, how would I go about it? If I've never put together a plan, yeah, you can what, do what, what am I bringing? Right. You could do something as simple as just drawing it out on a notepad. I'd, I'd recommend using a pad with a grid on it, right? A graph okay. paper grid and, okay. so, and draw it to scale. And as long as you include all the major structural components, meaning the foundation, the sill, the floor frame, the wall frame, the, the sheathing, and the siding, and the roofing, and the size of the lumbers on the roof, because all this is detect- dictated by the building code, especially if you live in an area to get snow, right? It should be a certain pitch. You might be sure. thinking you're using two by four for the rafters and the building inspector is probably going to say, no, you better use two by sixes to handle the snow load or whatever. So, but you could do that or the easiest way, of course, is buy a set of building plans. You know, okay. Just bring them. They're available everywhere. Just bring them in and say, this is what I want to build. You know, I might do this. I might make it smaller. I'm not going to put on a clabber. I'm going to do plywood siding or whatever. And, you know, you can make changes. That would be the easiest thing. But you could just draw something. I mean, I have drawings in my book in photographs okay. showing it. I mean, I'm not sure you could possibly just take a book like that into the building inspector. I'm building this. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, so yeah. I'd say, okay, fine. Now, of course, you have to then build it the way you show it. Because right. Like, <laughs> Wait a minute. You know, why did you change that? Um, and what do you suggest for the exterior? What's your favorite? Like, if I want just something that's going to last and I and low maintenance, right. what would you suggest? Yeah. We, I've put on pretty much every imaginable siding on these sheds. And again, just okay. to show different options for people. Um, my favorite would either be cedar bevel siding, which people around here call clabbards, or cedar shingles. I just, you know, maybe because I grew up in New England, but I just love that look. And sometimes okay. it's, you can put cedar bevel siding or clabbards on the front of the building and you do shingles on the ends of the building, which is a very traditional New England look. You see it on Cape Cod all the time. And I, I just think it's beautiful. And it's rustic and it's, it's very attractive. But there's no reason you couldn't use anything that you'd put on a house. You know, you could do okay. vinyl or aluminum siding. You could do uh, vertical boards, you see, like board and batten. I, I think I did sure. a board and batten in my latest book. A lot of the architecture for sheds are borrowed from barns. So you see a lot of vertical boards, a lot of board and batten, a lot of flat horizontal boards with shiplap, you know, because a lot of people like the fact that it looks like a little barn and that's fine. So now you do see a lot of pine. My only issue with pine is that it's not weather resistant. Cedar, redwood are all naturally weather resistant. Pine is not. Pine also costs about a quarter of the price. So that's why you see it. But if it's anywhere near the ground, if it's going to be getting wet, it's going to have snow pile up against it, it's, it's going to rot. No matter what you do to it, it's going to rot. And so the option is, well, let's build it up higher, up off the ground. Okay, but how practical is it to have a shed two feet off the ground? Right. <laughs> right exactly. You know, so it's like, all right, well, that solves the problem. But now I need, <laughs> I need a set of stairs and a ramp and an escalator right. to get my lawnmower out. So, um, 
you know, that that's the other issue. So pine is great and it's affordable and it looks really good. But as far as maintenance goes, it's it's going to be a problem, um, which is why you're seeing more and more sheds and homes, of course, at least trimmed out with like an ASIC product, you know, plastic lumber because it's completely right. weather resistant. Hey, Joe, if I wanted to learn more about your books, where would I go? You would go and buy the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're welcome. So, people are people are always welcome to contact me, but until you see the book, I'm not sure what you're going to ask me. But um, so, you, know, you you can go online. If you went to Amazon, and just looked up my book, and you can flip through it. You know, they have that that feature where you can click on the pages and they flip through, so you get right. a good idea of what the book looks like. You know, for me personally, you know, unless I'm holding a publication in my hands, I can't get a feel for it. So yeah. I mean, it's sold it's at Lowe's. It's sold at every place that's great books you know if anyone has any questions they can always contact me and how would i contact you um you can just email me it's j truini it's a letter j t r u i n i at a t t dot net beautiful i answer questions all the time excellent i appreciate your time joe the book i got fantastic very detailed you do a great job thank you jc i really appreciate it and thanks for having me on today that was a great interview yeah, very knowledgeable. If you're thinking about building your own shed, he has some excellent books. Mm-hmm. They have beautiful pictures, too. Yeah, in detail, really just step by step, especially if it's your first time you've ever built anything. Mm-hmm. And you know what's interesting? So he he's a contractor, he's an author, and he actually helped build the Pez candy factory. No way. You know, Pez was invented in oh, 1927 boy. in Austria. No. And the first candy came in small tins. <laughs> and then in 1955, they put the first heads on their dispensers. <laughs> and the first ones were Santa and Mickey Mouse. Mm, that's good, too. <laughs> so Joe's cool. <laughs> Do you have anything else to add? I would say make sure you call the village for the shed size and location restrictions. And mm-hmm. if you need permits, call 811 if you're in an area with snow, I would make sure I get a pitched roof. Mm-hmm. You want to have air circulation under and around your shed. And I would put it in a sunny area for less rot and corrosion. Mm-hmm. And then think about future use. You know, like Joe was saying, are you, you think it would be a fun workshop or a playhouse, mm-hmm. you know, putting firewood in there. And like we talked about in our patio episode, bigger is usually better. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, (laughs) Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our book, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Tip it, 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 tip it